<laughs> well, then, can everybody hear me? Okay, good. So, uh, I'm Neil Allen. Um, I just returned to USU in November, so I've just been here a short time. Uh, I was at Utah State University is working with Dr. Bob Hill, if any of you know him, as an irrigation specialist um, from 85 to 92. So I have some experience. The last 20 years I've um, been out of state doing consulting on water rights and with large irrigation districts and, and some farmers, but uh, a lot of water rights. And I'm, I'm going to talk about irrigation of small plots, and so I'm just kind of getting a feel for how, how small are they are the plots? How many are irrigating less than one acre that are here? Okay, so maybe a third of you. And how about one to five? Okay, and then I guess everybody else is over five. Maybe some big farmers, but uh, so it is. It is a pretty small plot. Uh, although, depending on how you're handling it, uh, several acres is quite a bit. Uh, and and mostly uh, sprinkler irrigation. How many sprinkler irrigators? Drip. Okay, mostly drip and surface. So come. Yes, a soaker, I guess, would be probably, uh, I'd call it in the drip family, but uh, yeah. You're going to have to apologize for my pictures because I've been with a consulting firm and I sign a thing that says every, all the work I do and all the pictures I take belong to the clients and, and the company. And so when I left, I left with, without any pictures for the last 20 years. But my wife grows about 100 different ornamentals, and since we've had such a tough winter, these are some of the first ones to come up, uh, just a Linton rose and a snow, snowy something or other. But uh, what is it? Okay. And so anyway, I just thought I'd throw. There'll be a few pictures along the way and uh, flowers, just because that's what those. I had a lot of flowers that. that that's from Fort Collins. I think it's probably. So if we wanted to evaluate the land, we want to look at the dimensions of the surface of the property, the exposure, crops, the vegetables, and the ornamental. Or you have more opportunities with those for irrigation. Um, the available water supply can be quite critical too. Um, you know, if it's a municipal or water supply, you might be paying quite a bit for your water. At a dollar per thousand gallons, that's uh, $325 an acre foot, and uh, I've paid up to $4 per thousand gallons, but I still grow my vegetables and fruit. I have about 30 different kinds of vegetables and fruit, and, and I still like to do that, so I'll pay that, but it's not, but it's just not something I would do and try to make a living with, but, uh, but uh, that's, if you have a well, that's usually a pretty good source of water, uh, it's generally clean water unless it's saline, but uh, it's a good source and, and not too expensive once you get your well in just for the energy. Or you might have irrigation water from a canal company and uh, or an irrigation company and then you might be subject to when the availability is and how much you get and for how long and, and how clean the water is, especially a lot of you had drip systems and so that can become quite an issue too is just the 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 debris in the water. Um, so we've talked a little bit about that and if you have a domestic supply or even a, an irrigation supply, um, most often you'll have adequate pressure. You won't need to pressurize the system for a drip system or, or for a sprinkler system. And so that, that's a, a plus not to have to deal with a, a pump, but uh, it's, it's easy enough to deal with a pump if, if you're trying to, to pressurize your system. And then uh, the timing and the demand, if you've got a, if you can get the water anytime you open the tap, that's pretty nice. It gives you a lot of flexibility, but if you have to wait, I was talking to somebody this morning, they get the water every 11 days. So that's, uh, so when I grew up, we had the water every 10 and a half days on an irrigation turn. So one time you got to have it in the morning and, or during the day and one time during the night. And, and it was, and it just rotated between two days. So you wasn't too hard to figure out. It's a three week, you get it twice in three weeks. And that seemed to be adequate and we were surface irrigating and then uh, they put it in a pipeline and it gave us a lot more flexibility. So 
So that uh, that's something to consider in the design of your irrigation system. I kind of went through some of these these costs, um, but if you're pumping the water, you know your energy cost might be in the fifteen to forty five dollars. So just I put this up here, and these are approximate, but uh, if we're looking at water cost of you know a, a dollar per thousand gallons, which is you know very reasonable. It's uh, the lower end of most of the water supplied by municipalities. Alfalfa, you could get about two tons of alfalfa for an acre foot of water. And onions, you should easily get ten thousand pounds. So you can see the difference there. And then sweet corn, four hundred and sixty dozen. So these were just taken off of the yields that. Uh, farmers get in their field and the water requirements. And then wheat, it's about 50 bushel for an acre foot of water. Um, and, and remember, we get uh, around four acre feet of water for that. So you can see that uh, for the price of water, you know, if your water's expensive, you probably got to stick with something other than uh, alfalfa and wheat. Although alfalfa and wheat's been pretty good prices for a while. Um, so there's only a few of you with surface irrigation. Um, surface irrigation in the West is still by far the most acres, um, by far. And that's just because of its energy requirement. It can be very efficient, um, but low energy requirements. And uh, I would say most of the vegetables that are grown in uh, Yuma and Arizona, well, Yuma, Arizona and California, most all of those are grown with surface irrigation. All the carrots and the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, um, all that is mostly surface irrigation. And it, uh, it works well if you've got good deep soils and you've leveled it and then you have good control of your water so you can put on large streams and get across it fast. And there is ways to take that from the big down to the little. Uh, so you can scale that down, but uh, the main thing is knowing how much infiltration time you have and uh, getting it on the soil in a, in a hurry so that you don't just irrigate the top of your row. And, um, but there are some disadvantages. Uh, you know, you need a, a big supply of water for a short time, a shorter time uh, for small fields and your field may not have the topography to work in, and it is less efficient in general than uh, uh, sprinkler and drip. So here's a couple of uh, pictures. Uh, I found that one in Bob's Hill's old files, and, and this one here was taken by a lady that I contact. She's got a lot of pictures of California agriculture, and, uh, but that's uh, in the Imperial Valley and uh, where they, they have a, a lot of surface irrigation. Probably about 450,000 acres of surface irrigation there. And I, I, I did take this one uh, last year on a water right. We were proving up the water right on this field and it had just been taken out of the desert. Uh, but uh, you can see that uh, stretch of water moving down. So that's a border that's 200 and something feet wide. They dump in 10 CFS. They move it down a quarter mile in uh, just a matter of a couple hours and then move it to the next field. And so you can see how smooth that's going down and this is at the top looking down. So as quick as they finish it up, you can see they've moved it from border to border. Uh, they get quite efficient irrigations because they move it to the, from the top to the bottom in a relatively short time and then just let it infiltrate and uh, don't have a lot of runoff and so this was just uh, a, a, I think they had just planted oats in this at the time to try and kind of get the soil work and then with sprinkler irrigations I think we're all quite familiar with that uh, even if it's just from our yards but um, it's very adaptable to odd shaped and small plots uh, and it works with most topography and soil. And uh, it's, it's kind of medium in the irrigation system cost. It's not as, doesn't cost as much as, uh, as some drip systems. Uh, 
we've got to pressurize the water and we've got to uh, filter the water but uh, we don't have to get it quite as well filtered as we would with uh, drip and, uh, and there are some crops that uh, you might want to keep the water off the foliage so just a couple examples of that uh, this this one here is is kind of a smaller you'll see a lot of sprinkler heads like that now versus the impact that they they use on quite a few fields and then here's uh, I, this is in the Imperial Valley also and uh, they're, they're probably germinating uh, carrots or lettuce and then they'll, they'll put a solid set out and they'll, they'll irrigate with this for about a month just to get the crops established and then they'll pull all those pipe off and then with those furrows they'll, they'll irrigate and they, they probably have about uh, six to eight rows of uh, carrots on top of that and, and maybe six rows of, of onions if, if those are onions. So they keep pretty much the same. And this is uh, one that I took that same trip in Nevada there's where they grow, it's pretty high in elevation but very dry but they grow onions there and, and there you'll see they're, they're using those different type of heads too. And there they just keep it the same, they solid set to germinate their onions. And so we'll spend uh, most of our time on drip irrigation system. And so you can just review there that um, I've been using drip irrigation on my yards for the last 20 years. And so, and uh, there's actually some of the drip tubing that I've carried with me from over place to place as I've moved. And uh, so it, it lasts pretty long. And the last place I was at is there 15 years. And and um, still using the same drip tubing that I uh, put in originally and haven't had to replace any of it. And luckily haven't had any emitter, plug emitter problems. But um, it has a lot of good capabilities and um, one thing that I like about it if, if you've got it so it's really good for that. Uh, there's a little, I've had a little problem, sometimes I just end up uh, sprinkling a little bit to germinate carrots and lettuce and a few of the fine seeds. And so um, you don't often get the entire surface wetted and if your seed is just a quarter inch under then that's it's a little harder to get germination. You have to leave a little bit more water on there. And then it requires some fields and so the filtration is a higher cost. Of I did, my wife did take a couple, fly, a couple pictures, um, so in Fort Collins you probably don't have that much problem here because I don't remember it when I lived here so much, but we always, we were getting hail storms all the time and so at least you can see my drip tape there because it's taken all the leaves off the, off the plants and off the grapes, but uh, uh, I've just used it in the garden and I just, it's a, on top of the ground, I just pull it off to to till it and put it back on. Um, and because of, uh, so I, I always call this my greenhouse, but now here I know this is my high tunnel. <laughs> and so, and, and the idea came because, uh, you know, I wasn't really into this stuff, but uh, my uh, youngest daughter was just graduated from high school and she had all her friends and some big boys were jumping on the trampoline and they went through the mat and so so I had a trampoline frame and I wasn't going to put the, another mat on it because uh, he was off to college and so um, anyway so I used it and I just went to Craigslist and got a few more so I so that was the hoops and uh, I actually got I got uh, three trampolines for nothing on Craigslist but uh, <laughs> and they're pretty sturdy I, I like to weld I grew up on the farm so I just welded them all together and I don't have to worry about snow I'm an engineer, so I designed it so it wasn't going to fall down. So it's a little over-designed, but uh, anyway, th that was great. And th there's some peppers that uh, uh, that we like to grow there. Uh, uh, Marconi, that's what uh, we like those. But uh, so so I've had that for I, th I think probably five or six years, and and it's uh, I just roll the sides up 
when it gets hot in the summertime and just leave them up, uh, maybe roll them up to somewhere there and just leave it open and it doesn't get too hot and leave, leave the doors open. So other than that, I don't have ventilation, but uh, definitely it, it brings in the lettuce early and, uh, and uh, just really much more production of tomatoes and peppers. And I also do maybe squashing. So here's some approximate cost of, uh, of the surface irrigation. Um, because of the land leveling and the, and the head ditches and how fancy you want to get, there's quite a range of costs. But, but I've seen them spend up to $1,000 an acre, but probably more typical, it's two or $300 for some good laser land leveling an acre. And then your head ditches can, can add another couple hundred dollars an acre to uh, but if you're just going with earth ditches and, and uh, canvas dams, it can be quite a bit less, too. And then with the solid set sprinkler, uh, you can either, the choice of uh, PVC, as you saw in those earlier pictures, PVC or aluminum, but uh, they're in the range of 1700 to $2,000 an acre. And so... Um, the growers in most of these places, they rent the sprinkler and the pump, uh, and they just rent it. The people come out and put it on, but uh, and and that's that's uh, probably three or four hundred dollars just to get an acre. To them come out, put it on, irrigate it for a month, get it germinated and going, and then pull it off. But hand lines are definitely the least cost of the sprinklers because you can use uh, one sprinkler on a lot of different places, and so. Uh, the, then the permanent <clears throat> is probably a little bit more than the surface. And so the permanent, I'm thinking of the, the type you see in orchards with the little sprinkler coming up for each of the uh, things. Or they do it sometimes in pastures and, and, and other things. But uh, they, they do bury it and have, have permanent systems that, that work well in certain applications. And I, I just pulled this out of a drip manual, but... Uh, you can see that um, the drip acres are primarily on permanent crops and, and row crops. And row crops are the, the vegetables. And that's because of their cost. Um, but you can see that the gravity acres are, are still way up there. This happens to be for California, but in Utah we have a carbon thing about uh, drip that can change a lot is um, I've seen drip spacing as, as tight as 18 inches and those that are growing melons and, and different crops or, you know, the, in heavier soils they'll just have one drip tape and have it spaced six feet you know one for each bed of, of, of melons or squash and, uh, so there's those around if you want and, but, and you take them out of the bag but you know it, it, there's just all kinds of things that you can get but the the tubing lasts a lot longer, but the drip tape is is the lay flat stuff that, uh, and then you can either get uh, pressure compensating emitters or just emitters that uh, the press the discharge varies by the pressure by the square root of the pressure, and then we can go automated or manual, and uh, the filtration depending on if we need to get the sand media filters. And I've seen some that work on pretty small flow rates too. We always think of those as being big, but they do they do make some small ones and then or we can use the screen or the fielders. Um, and if if you go to somebody an irrigation company, they can provide a lot of help and there's quite a bit of information on the internet, a lot of design manuals, there's software that can be available and we don't have time to get into the calculations or anything, but I will show you some examples of a few things. Um, so these are the basic um, basic things we need. I've got to move faster. Um, the pump, the backflow preventer, and vacuum breaker, depending on what system you're on, the filter system there. Um, this is what, uh, like I say, m my wife has about a hundred different uh, flowers. Uh, and I had, she did the flowers, I did the, uh, the rest of it. But these are some of the things that, that I did in, in, uh, in the gardens that I've had over the years and uh, the spacing. And so 
raspberries, I, I put them in a contained area and then just about 30 inch spacing on the drip lines and, and that works well. The strawberries are, are about the same, just down the rows, uh, down the beds. Um, grapes, just one, one drip line. And I've laid mine on the ground. I think a lot of people tie them up on their uh, trellises to keep the mice away, but I didn't have a mouse problem. And the trees, I looped them around the, the larger uh, fruit trees, the uh, apples and peaches. And then uh, uh, we, grew, we grew gladolias and dahlias, and uh, we would put them about three feet apart, but we'd put a row of flowers on each side of the tape. And that, that really works well, and it seems to be good, efficient use of the ground. And the perennials, just uh, depending on what they were, but 12 to 8 inches. And onions, I would either put two tapes down on a bed and put four rows of onions or sometimes six rows of onions. They both work well and produce well. And the soil I had was a little on the heavy side, but I think even on some of the finer sands that would work well. Carrots, uh, about the same as the onions. Green beans, one line, but two... One line for two lines of beans is what I would do. Uh, peppers, um, I would plant them 18 inches apart with just one line. Tomatoes and squash, the same way. Cabbage and cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, those colder crops, I would just one line and, and space them out at about 18 inches. And then, you know, I'll, you can just look at those other ones, but I found that uh, I get more production if I just in less space and less drip tape if I, on most cr most vegetables, put two rows of vegetables for one roll of tape. Yes? So, yeah, so we'll get into that, but basically there's two kinds of emitters. One's a pressure compensating emitter. So most of those from a pressure from maybe seven or eight pounds up to 30 pounds, you'll get, if you have an emitter that, that's 0.2 gallons per hour, it'll be pretty close to 0.2 gallons per hour. They have they they rate those, and I don't know that you always get the best uh, drip tape from those stores, but uh, you know because the, they're the commercial tape that the farmers use, you know it it's just not the same as what they buy in the stores for some reason. I don't know why they don't sell the same thing, but uh, I, I think it does better. But but if you're if you just buy the laminar flow type that don't have a pressure compensating, then it, it changes a lot. So if you double your pressure, you increase your flow by about 40 percent, square root of two. So the pressure, yeah. So they should be pretty close to the same. Um, yeah, if they're, if they're, if they're good equipment, they should be close to the same. Um, I've grown celery before in California, but when we lived in Sacramento, but here they're, here they're planting celery into dry soil, and they've had to put the emitters a little closer together so they can get it wet up quick enough to, before the celery uh, dries out. And that, that's about the way I do all my vegetables, just lay the tape down the middle and then a row on each side of it. And here's uh, just an example of where they've got the, the drip tape buried and a lot of times they'll bury a drip tape and then they'll just keep it there for four or five years but they just farm the same rows so, so they'll change the crops but farm the same rows and uh, met with one grower uh, well he was at a conference and he was kind of worried about he laid all his drip tape with GPS the tractor and then uh, he was hoping, it was in alfalfa, he was hoping he could go back in and rip that alfalfa up and leave his drip tape in, hoping his GPS would remember where all the tape was. But, uh, he'll, he'll let us know how that went. <laughs> <laughs> but the tape that I've used, I haven't used tape, but I mean, I've used tape just a little bit to play with it, but I've used tubing and, and it's lasted a good 15 years on top of the ground. And I'll move it off and move it back on and it's, it's still good. So uh, it depends on the soil, but usually about eight inches, six to eight inches deep. Yeah, and now, see, uh, well, let's see, I think on the next one here, well, I think that uh, those grapes there, I think that the tape is, from here I can't see it. I was thinking it was on off the ground. 
And uh, here's another just where they've had to put them a little close together for germination. That's normally not how they germinate. They usually don't germinate with tape, but they found if they get the emitters, uh, see this is 8 inches on the right and the 12 inches on the left, but if you left it there, and I, I think I calculated out how much water they were putting on. They said they were running it for 30 hours, so that's a two and a half inch irrigation. So a pretty good soaking for those little bands, but that's what it took to get get the water spread out. So the majority of the water definitely goes down. It doesn't go out. So oh, that's the picture that has the drip tape on along the off the ground, and that's good for for rodents. And also you can visually see if your tape's working okay. So just some questions you might ask is how many feet of tubing can I operate with my water? And the answer is just about if, if you have uh, you can just do a lot of things with your water supply. So this is if you were looking at 10 gallons, 5 gallons a minute, that's probably less than most garden hoses. So that's like a, a hose bib is 5 gallons a minute. If you get the right tape, you could probably run 3,000 feet of tape with that. Or you could run, um, you know, this here is probably maybe more like you would get in, uh, I think, like this would be one gallon per hour per foot. That's quite a bit of water, more than agriculture uses, because they, they run a lot of feet of pipe and on not that much water. But if you're half that, 1,000 feet on five gallons per minute, and of course, and then you just and that's how much you can run at one time. You might have 10,000 feet and just be moving it through blocks. So even with a small garden hose, you can run a lot of, lot of pipe because these are the ranges that you can buy drip tape in or drip tubing. And um, this is how long you can make a row. And this is the small diameter, 5 eighths, and just as an example. And, and these are fairly high flow rates, 0.67 GPM per 100 feet because you could go down to a third of that and make much longer. But you can see that uh, flow rate. Here's a half gallon a minute per 100 feet. So those are not that low of flow rates for drip tubing, and still you can run pretty long lines with it. And you can buy tape that goes clear up to more than an inch in diameter. So this is just a little over half, what we call half inch. And then the other question would be, how much time should I run an irrigation set? And it's kind of a two-step process. You would want to know how much, you know, your, your gallons per minute for your tape or your gallons per hour per 100 feet. And then you would want to know your line spacing, and uh, that would vary it. And these are pretty simple calculations. I, I hope to make some applications that could just be downloaded, and then you could just plug numbers in. Because it's not hard math, but unless you want to sit down and do it, uh, but you can see that you can get different application rates in inches per hour. So if you're going to irrigate every three or four days, and and in the hot part of the summer, you might at least, uh, if we just take a number, if you're down around uh, even, you know, whoops, like. Uh, half an inch an hour, you know, you would you know you would need to run at least a couple hours on that set every every three or four days during the hotter part of the summer. And then th this is the time that you'd run. So if you and it's pretty straightforward, but if you have an application rate that's a half a half an inch per hour and you wanted to put down one inch, then you've got to run it for uh, 120 minutes, two hours. So, so that's you know kind of a two-step process. But uh, normally you would run these drip tapes um, every uh, few days or every day. I mean, you know, you can run a drip tape every day. I normally run my drip tapes every three days through the hottest part of the summer and stretch it out more than that other times of year. But, and so uh, this would be. The other question is, if, if you're looking at your water supply, uh, maybe you've got a, a well that's uh, 20 gallons a minute, um, which is a small flow rate, but maybe that's all you have. You could, uh, in most areas of the state, 
you could irrigate uh, three acres because it takes about seven gallons per minute per acre. And I've, I've included uh, the ir irrigation efficiencies in here. And so this is, so I think in, at least in the northern part of the state, you could probably uh, seven gallons a minute or less per acre. So if you had uh, 20 gallons a minute, you could easily irrigate three acres. So that kind of gives you a little bit depending on your water supply. And, and this is if you ran it nearly continuously. So gives you some ideas of uh, what you can operate with the water supply that you have. Um, you can know how much water you need to apply. We ha have some data posted on a website at uh, Utah State University. And if you just so just some management concepts with it. And uh, I, like I say, I have not had one plug emitter, but I've been on domestic water supplies for the last 20 years, and I haven't had any plugging at all. And I just have uh, a 200 uh, mesh filter. And I, th I think even with some emitters, you might be OK with 140 mesh or use the disk, but be equivalent. And if I had a big system, I would put emit, I'd put a filter at the water source and then some smaller filters maybe before the manifolds because they're not very expensive and drip, plug drip tubing is a problem. So uh, depending on how clean you think your water is. And also domestic water has enough chlorine in it that uh, you don't seem to have a problem with that. But if you're using ditch water, you might want to add some uh, chlorine to it uh, occasionally kind of monitor it, but you can get some, some slimes in there that will plug emitters. So. Just some ideas of different things. Uh, and I always drain the system in the fall. Um, I blow it out, but you, you know there might be other ways to drain it, but and it's pretty easy to do. Um, and I flush lines once in a while too, but I haven't. I always put the emitter on top. Because if there's solids or sediments, they'll be on the bottom of the pipe. And so that's always a good thing to put the emitter on the top. Even the buried tubing, you should put the emitter on the top. So, um, Oh, micro-irrigation. The thing about that is it uh, covers more area, which is better for trees. They have a larger root zone than smaller plants. So that, they're great, and you can see that it's working. So that's it. Some more flowers from my wife's garden. <laughs> We're going to have spring here soon. <laughs> Do we have time for a question? or uh, Visit with, with me. You can contact me uh, uh, through email or, or, or my name's at, on the USU website. But, yeah, you know, the problem with ditch water, it's not only debris, it's weed seed and a lot of things. Yes. But, but there are some ways to, to filter that, uh, even with surface irrigation. It generally takes a little bit of head, though, and so it depends on, you know, if you've got some head. But if you're willing to, to lift it a little bit, uh, you can get some pretty good, you can run it through some very fine screen that's fine enough, it doesn't plug, but the water moves off. So, so contact me about that. Okay, thanks.